So one uh, one example, like Kant has three formulations of the categorical imperative that we know of. Like I think that's that's the ones I remember. Uh, I'm by no means a Kant scholar, only a <laughs> someone who has interest in the topic. So I, I, if there is any more, I haven't uh, stumbled onto them. But the three formulations of categorical imperative is formulation one, uh, act only according to the maxim that which you could at the same time will were a universal law. This is mouthful. So basically what it is, is um, you, you should only act in, in sorts of like rules that you can max, uh, have be universalized as uh, permissibility goes. Like, if I am stealing something, can that be universally permissible for everyone to steal something at any point, any given time, sort of thing? Uh, um, that is the first formulation. The second formulation, which is a, a lot of the times overlooked, is humanity formulation. Uh, it is act as uh, humans being ends in of themselves rather than just mere means, which is to say, you can use people, right? Like other people, you can use them to, towards your own ends, but never only as towards your ends. You should always consider their personal ends as well. They all have ends in them, in of themselves. Every person has a goal. Uh, you, they are not mere tools to you, but if you have an agreed upon goal or instrumentally you have some agreement, uh, they, they have a certain goal. And if they reach that goal, you ha are closer to your goal. That kind of usury, using other people in that kind of way is fine in a Kantian understanding. And the third formulation is, which my favorite is kingdom of ends formulation, which is similar to second. It's basically treating everyone as, uh, their kingdoms of themselves, like as ends in of themselves, ca causing like a kingdom of ends, which I personally believe is like a capistan. <laughs> like maybe all people are uh, in a sort of can, uh, 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 king, uh, kingdoms of like their own, uh, worlds, but they have an agreements, etc. Those kinds of like wor working towards that kind of world is basically Kant's understanding. Uh, those are the three major formulations. And I think they lend themselves pretty well to libertarian, um, uh, theory. Um, though, of course, um, I'm sure liquids <laughs> would disagree in certain regards, but I, I like the, I'll pass it, pass it to him, man. Well, before we get into that, oh, I'd okay. like to point out that I do see, and like, I see that there could be potentially some type of a parallel between, you know, this Kantian understanding and also the philosophy of Stoicism as it was, you know, originally set out, you know, by the Greek philosophers, you know, thousands of years ago, uh, basically in that, you know, they would hold reason and virtue as the highest good. Mm -hmm. And, you know, since Kant, Kant put so much focus on the whole idea of reason itself, yeah. and he also he talks of, you know, where in Stoicism, virtue revolves around making your society a better place, and they do this to the point of self-sacrifice, which mm -hmm. can be considered, you know, altruistic. And I know that that's most likely where, you know, I think that would be precisely where uh, Zulu would have the, uh, the gripes with uh, Kant in this case. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I guess that would be a good way to seg into uh, into what you were going to say, uh, Liquid Zulu. Sure. So um, I suppose my problem with uh, Kant in terms of uh, ethics isn't necessarily Kant himself. It's what he allowed to uh, come out of his system. So if you, on Kant's view, really, uh, I've like looked into his ethics as much as I can. Um, all I can really d get out of him in terms of ethics is the categorical imperative. That seems to be all he's, you know, saying in so far as ethics is concerned. If you, that, that you know, just basically universalizability, to put it another way. So I would agree that that is potentially a necessary condition. You know, you wouldn't be wanting to part randomly particularize your norm. So it's one rule for this group, another rule for that group, and there's no reason mm -hmm. to particularize it in this way. So I'd agree to that. It's, it's, it's a necessary condition if formulated correctly, but I don't think it's sufficient at all to get you any sort of an ethical system because you could have, you know, invert some random norm and then, you know, that's also going to be universal, right? But that's um, sort of, that's just a sort of attack on like, you know, it doesn't get you much. But then from the, his derivatives, you get like on Kantian metaphysics, you get a complete 
subjectivism, a complete collectivism. Um, Because to Kant, the objective is actually the collectively subjective. It's when all humans yes. have this, you know, subjective understanding of something, of the noumenal world, and that's you have this collectivism entrenched right down into his metaphysics. And then, you know, when Hegel comes along, he goes, well, this noumenal thing you brought in here, that's a load of nonsense, get rid of it. Let's throw that out of the door, because, you know, Hegel doesn't give a damn about trying to save God or anything like that, which is what Kant went to. That's why he brought in the noumenal world. Uh, you know, Hegel didn't give a crap about any of that. So Hegel gladly threw away the noumenal world and made everything just completely and utterly subjective and collective, right? So it's, you know, these neo-Kantians, they're going around and they're saying, well, it's when everyone kind of agrees that this is the way we should do it, therefore we should do it. So, you know, that's, uh, you have Nazism on that view, for instance. It's uh, the Aryan race has some particular way of, uh, doing things, so we should, um, you know, that, that's that's what Aryans have to be doing, right? You're you're either uh, you you're either adopting this Aryan Aryan logic, you know, you've got polylogism, and then you have to think in the Aryan ways, you know, you have to think in the Aryan ways, you have to be perceiving, you have Aryan concepts, and then you are an Aryan, right? And you know, obviously Marxism, because uh, you know they 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 have have the same source. It's all in Kant. All of the worst philosophies. Pick some dictator of the 20th century, and you can derive their views. If you if you read them, you know, read their books, they'll say, yeah, no, uh, we're, we're getting it from like Hegel, we're getting it from Kant, we're getting it from Heraclitus, we're getting it from these people. Right? You, you can read their books and they'll tell you exactly where they're getting it from. So, you know, maybe uh, given all Kant get, did you on ethics, if you just look at Kant's ethics and you say categorical imperative, universalization, great. Yeah, you could you could definitely say that that is compatible with libertarianism. It's also compatible with all kinds of evil philosophies, and it's I would say more consistently compatible with those evil ones because he has a deep metaphysical collectivism, which is kind of just completely antithetical to libertarianism, which has meth methodological individualism. Right. So yes, I know that both Marx and Mises. You know, despite being such different people, both counted, you know, Kant as an influence in this case. Mm -hmm. And, you know, speaking of Marx, I know another example is that Marx was also influenced by Aristotle, for example. He took some of his philosophy and, you know, used that to come up with his idea of, you know, all exchanges having to be between two items of equal value, which, you know, Bumbaverk obviously came along and, you know, debunked that. But <laughs> basically... Um, I just find it interesting that, you know, I'm not saying that Aristotle is, is inherently a Marxist philosopher or anything like that, <laughs> but it's that, you know, somebody can he see a certain uh, philosopher such as this, and they can take that and run with it in a certain way. Now, and like you are saying earlier, I mean, this isn't Kant's fault, you know, specifically. It's more along the lines of the people who tend to follow him or how they perceive his ideas. So I'm curious uh, what you would think, you know, the responsibility would be uh, for Kant in this case. Do you think that... Do you think that he himself made some type of an error in formulating his his philosophical system itself? Yes, I think uh, I think Kant is to blame here. Um, and the reason for this is like he sets out on his philosophical journey. Like he wasn't just like going like, oh well, I get a human. This human guy, he's got some great arguments. I guess I'm going to be a human now. No, he he had he had a goal in mind, right? He had big plans for his numinal world, as uh, Peikoff puts it. Like he because these rationalists at the time, you know. We might think of like in the modern times, you know, like a rationalist might be some like Reddit neckbeard type, you know, atheist, but they were all Christians at this time, right? This was still in the 18th century, right? So all yeah, these like, rationalists, they were going through like not at all related to yeah. rationalism. Yeah, go on, sorry. They they, they were like um they, these rationalists at the time, the, the dogmatic uh, rationalists, you can call them, you know, um they were all going through great lengths to try and keep God in the system, right? Because these skeptics kept coming in and these like, you know, enlightenment philosophers kept coming in and ramming God up the arse. And they were like, well, I don't like this. So they kept constructing ever more elaborate systems of thought to try and keep God in the picture somehow, some way, you know, Descartes had crazy, like, you know, it's clear and distinct to me that God must exist, you know, uh, he had <laughs> crap like that. Um, you know, and then, but then these late, the, you know, the later Cartesians just throw the God out, you know. So all these philosophers, they spend a great deal of time just trying to construct these horrible systems of thought. And then they just make some horrific leap, some arbitrary leap to try and keep God in picture. And then the derivatives will just throw out that arbitrary leap and they're left with the horrible husk of a philosophy. So this happened with Descartes, it happened with 
I'm um, sure it happened with Spinoza and Leibniz, though I'm not actually sure, too familiar with their philosophies. And I know it happened with Kant. So Kant, the way he tried to keep God in the picture was basically write, okay, let's go back to the basics. Where does all this God metaphysics, where does the Christian metaphysics drive from? It drives from this Plato fella. Well, I'm going to modernize his world of forms into the noumenal and phenomenal world. So there's a completely ineffable, untouchable noumenal world. You could never have contact with it. So it's completely outside the realm of reason. Reason only applies to the phenomenal world, right? You can only have faith about what is in the noumenal world. This is how he saved faith. And um, there's a quote from him here. Let's see. Uh... Yes, I have therefore found it necessary to deny, to deny knowledge in order to make room for faith. He said this in his Critique of Pure Reason, and also in the Prolegomena, because that's just a shorter version of that. Um, but like, this was his view of, from the start. He wanted to have some way to keep faith in. So, you know, it would be if somebody came to him and said, well, these arguments for God, they're completely irrational, they make no sense. He'd be like, well, whoa, that only applies to the phenomenal world though, bro. So but in the noumenal world, who knows what goes on? And um, this, you know, then Hegel comes along, says, well, this pheno- this noumenal world doesn't make any sense, right? We don't have to have this in our system. So he threw it out and then just, com- we have, we are left with just total and complete subjectivism, right? And that's just the death of philosophy at this point. And um, I, I have some more stuff to say, but I'll, I suppose I'll leave uh, Mish to respond. <laughs> uh, the way I see it... Um is I would definitely not blame Kant for any um, for further development that people perverting his mind uh, ideas to uh, achieve at due to the fact that none of them are consistent with his beliefs or at least like the whole of his things. Of course, people can pick and pick and pick in parts what they believe about certain things, but you could do it. You could you could do that with any part of philosophy. You wouldn't say. Um, Hitler is evil because he thought, you know, vegetarian, like he was a vegetarian. He would say he's evil for, you know, other reasons. Um, but uh, in the same vein, I don't think Kantianism does lend itself. I do think if we only had Kant be about, you know, universalization principle, I could see maybe, but even that, I'm not so sure, uh, applies because um, he does have more content. He does actually believe more than that. And he does actually talk about more than that in uh, groundwork and metaphysics of morals, not grammar. They are two different books. It's confusing. So, so people generally tends to say groundwork word and metaphysics of morals. Sorry. Uh, that was a small tangent, but um, uh, I don't see, especially ethically, the, Continuation. I understand the uh, argument for metaphysically coming to that conclusion, but um, you could come to those kinds of conclusion with plenty of different metaphysical assumptions, plenty of different uh, understandings. And it's so clear that parts of these philosophies are clearly cut off from their source. Like they're not really continuing the tradition. They're not continuing the understanding, uh, clearly differentiating themselves um, in many ways. I don't see Hegel as a necessary condition uh, of Kant, like necessary continuation. If anything, I would say the mantle of Kantian philosophy falls down to someone like Husserl rather than Hegel, uh, um, if there would have to be someone. Um, and the many of the neo-Kantians, explicit neo-Kantians, not just Hegelian, Hegelians who who Hegel being inspired by Kant, uh, I'm, I'm saying like exactly neo-Kantians have been on the forefront against many Nazi beliefs. Like for instance, I remember um, uh, Ernst Cassier as a very explicit example. Ernst Cassier was a uh, 19, I think 19th century, philo- 18th, no, 20th century philosopher who had a, explicit debate with a Nazi philo- philosopher, um, uh, Heidegger, uh, Martin Heidegger, uh, in, um, uh, th- th- there's quite, quite a lot of evidence to support that, uh, many Kantians that are consistent to, in application would not lead to those kinds of beliefs. 
systems. Um, but I, I understand that uh, critique. I don't see it as too much of a problem. Um, I do agree with uh, some parts of even the critique that Zulu is raising, but my argument would just be it if it is true, it is true. I do believe certain parts of it is true. So it wouldn't matter if it's like undesirable. We're not going to judge a philosophy by how much we prefer to believe it rather than how much of it is, is true. And I do believe it is true. So, and that, in that understanding, um, definitely I can understand that, but yeah, I would leave it at that, I guess.